Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, part 31 of our series uh, on libraries and recovery. Uh, today is December 18th, and uh, we're here for uh, an outlook to 2021. Uh, we may look back a little bit, of course, uh, but we're going to focus on kind of critical elements of expanded connectivity, uh, E-rate, middle mile, spectrum, and, and more. Uh, we have two outstanding guests I'll introduce in a moment. Uh, the series, which we started in late March, uh, right after the pandemic was declared, as I say, uh, like, well, it started out as libraries WTF, and then it, we rolled into libraries in response. You know, okay, what are we going to do about this? How are we going to uh, uh, take care of people's needs? I say we, I mean, I'm speaking of the library world generally. Uh, I'm not a librarian myself. Gigabit Libraries is a uh, is a uh, an association, a collaboration, really, an ad hoc uh, a group of uh, libraries, library associations, doing what we think are interesting things with uh, technology. And lately, in the last, I say lately, the last few years, we've been focused specifically on uh, using wireless technologies to extend access to the library, to the library's digital services. One of which, of course, is the is the internet. Uh, our partner in the series is the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, uh, which is hosting and recording the sessions and at the controls of Steven Weiber in the Nether in Netherlands. And uh, so these uh, recordings are all found. The prior thirty. If I got the number right now, all prior recorded sessions are found on the pandemic response page at giglibraries.net, where this one will be uh, by Monday. So the, the, the question that popped up once everything closed down in March was, well, okay, well, then what is a library if the building is closed? It's, it's not entirely closed. I mean, the building is, uh, was, and in different levels partially open, a little bit open, some are open by appointment. It varies, it has varied over these, wow, now 10 months of this incredible event, uh, which as we all know, just suddenly transformed, not just kind of our society, but civilization at large had to conform to what this virus would allow it to do. And for the most part, uh, we have uh, and more or less to more or less success. The aspects of this question, this kind of existential question that we focused on is just a rough taxonomy here, uh, internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure, which we added uh, once it became clear, or not clear, but once we were reminded that uh, of the active role that libraries play in their communities, uh, and, and the cohesion and the sense of the community has of itself in terms of the services it provides to itself. Because libraries are almost invariably locally uh, managed and funded. Uh, they're, they're, they're the quintessential community institution. And as we've been referring to them, the, the Swiss army knife of public institutions. They do more things for more people than any other public entity by far. I mean. Libraries will do basically anything you ask them to do if they can. Uh, and some of them are maybe not entirely within the scope of uh, regulations. Uh, they, they'll help anybody without asking any questions. You, you're in the country without papers. You're curious about the latest uh, rumor about ICE. You can go into a library with confidence that uh, you won't get busted. They won't even ask you. Just sure, what do you need? Well, it's over here, we'll help you out. This, this fifth element we're planning to add for the coming year, community technology policy. We think this is a really big deal uh, because of the, what we're gonna cover today is the, the, the lack of universal uh, availability of access to the digital world, which uh, as our speakers will make clear, as many of you already appreciate, is, is has become essential. It was already incredibly important. Now within the context of the pandemic, 
it's become a critical capability for people to just function. But it, it, it already was basically uh, uh, essential for people to participate uh, economically, uh, socially, and the rest of it. Where we're all going with this is a huge question and one we're looking to dive into in the coming year. You know, what, what are really the implications? What are this, what's the impact of this thing that we've created in just a couple of decades has completely transformed society, uh, which if you think about it would collapse immediately if the internet went away. So uh, what, what, what are the community's role in that? What, what can they do for themselves to enhance and extend and secure uh, that capability? So there's, there's a lot of questions around that and a lot of opportunity we're gonna get into in the coming year. Uh, today, we are extremely fortunate to have two very fine folks uh, sharing their experience, wisdom, and insights and outlooks, uh, if, if they will, about what's coming next. Tom Wheeler, uh, the former chair of the FCC, now with Brookings, uh, and author of this uh, really comprehensive uh, uh, paper, and I think that was late May, uh, I'll post these links in the chat so that people can get at them, but uh, you can also just look those up. And Michael Calabrese, uh, a longtime associate and director of the Wireless Future Project at New America's Open Technology Institute and author of the Online Learning Equity Gap, which has just been published, I think about a week ago and uh, makes a very detailed analysis of the circumstance and a, and a call to action. And, and uh, Michael's gonna take us through that. Uh, just a little tip of next week, which will be effectively our last uh, session in the series this year. We're privileged to have uh, Michael, uh, Michelle Jeske, the director of the Denver Public Library and the, and the current president of the Public Library Association. Uh, she'll be joined by Julie Walker, the Georgia State Librarian, uh, who's doing some really interesting things with wireless across the state and uh, also has been on a, a, a previous speaker. So be sure and tune in for that. Uh, before we get into that, it's time for the COVID report. Um, it's really been something here. This is a little over a month ago. These graphs are familiar to uh, those of you returning. Uh, we've been tracking these more or less, and this was this was early November. Uh, we were we had just uh, 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 passed through you know roughly a thousand people succumbing uh, on a daily basis to the to this uh, to this virus uh, to this disease uh, created by the virus, uh, and the, and the rates were climbing. A month later, we're we're hitting 3,000 a month later. We're hitting triple the number of fatalities on this, and uh, another what, uh, nearly five million cases just within roughly 30 days. Uh, the numbers are going up. I'm, this is you know people are getting this in the news. I'm just recapping it, kind of the experience and the reference point for what's going on, and uh, how it's you know changing. Here just in the last week. Um, we've gone, we've blown through, uh, 3000. Don, and, can I, yeah. do you mean, do you mean to be sharing your slides right now? Holy cow. That was very polite. I'll leave you to it. I think you just, just embarrassed me completely. We're good now. Thank you. Speak up a little earlier, please, Steve, next time. I... That's what we just ran through there. Uh, so that's why you didn't see uh, the links for uh, Tom and Michael. And this is uh, next week. And these are the graphs for the, for the progress of uh, COVID over the last month and in the last week. Uh, at this rate, we're going to hit... Uh, uh, we're going to hit 400, 450,000 people deceased by uh, end of the year. And this is a, a flashback. This is a slide from uh, late June. We were kind of freaking out as the, as the rolling average of cases uh, hit 30,000 a day. 
and uh, and then Europe dropped and the US looked like it was going to and then shot back up. So that was 30,000, you know, now it's uh, 218,000 a day. So just to kind of what's the acceleration rate and, and of course we've got good news that the, that the vaccines are on the horizon but it's not gonna happen soon. And, you know, they're saying after what is it? 50 million people are treated in the U.S. Uh, 330 million. Uh, we won't have any more uh, supply until mid uh, mid summer. So it's it's live and with us. Uh, so uh, we're going to get into our presentations here, and this is just kind of a, a highlight uh, of some of the issues that I think Michael's going to touch on, uh, and Tom too, of course, is welcome. Uh, the E-rate is the principal source of uh, funding, or rather the discount program to support funding for uh, schools and libraries to uh, access the internet. Uh, and this is the case that Michael is making, many are making right now, is that it seems like the FCC has confused uh, the building, the school building with the school as opposed to say the school is actually the learners, wherever they may be as the school. And if this building is closed, like with the library, you know, what is the school? The school is where the learners are, the learners are online. If they're not online, they're not at school. And, and if very many are not schooled, we just not having school. And that's kind of the, the, the dilemma that we've been facing all you know parents the whole society this is this is the thing that affects probably society as much as anything else uh is, is what's happening to these kids all day and 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 what's going to happen in the future middle mile for many of you this is very familiar stuff middle middle mile is uh, uh the term that uh was adopted about 10 years ago as part of the the last stimulus broadband stimulus program uh to connect anchor institutions this was really twofer. This was a powerful concept, at least we think. We're still advocating for this as we move into a potential new broadband uh, stimulus is that connecting all the anchor institutions, the libraries, the schools, the clinics, and so forth, uh, as a way to supply these priority endpoints with connectivity is also a way to deliver uh, interconnect points approximately uh, in every neighborhood in a market for potential last mile providers, public, private, wired, wireless, and to lower their cost and risk of, of building out. Uh, and uh, uh, a deployment that could be justified just to reach the anchor institutions alone, which is what E-rate does and restricts to, that this is not uh, able to be reused or shared, the lines uh, subsidized by E-rate. But under the stimulus program, it was used for building open access uh, fiber. It's a great, uh, a, a great program, a great approach. We hope it, it can take hold uh, if we do the next uh, broadband stimulus. It actually uh, enabled a large part of the goal uh, from the National Broadband Plan, uh, number four, to provide uh, gigabit level fiber to anchor institutions in every community. We're close. The schools have done really well. The library's not so well. Uh, and then we're going to touch on spectrum. These are, this is just kind of the alphabet soup of, of uh, uh, telecom acronyms uh, for wireless. That should be spectrum, citizens band radio spectrum. These are all being used uh, by uh, uh, libraries and schools and communities uh, to connect people. And uh, Michael maybe just, Michael has been on before and gave us a detailed look at, at these different technologies. Maybe he'll talk about their applicability and the potential to close the gap with them now. So let's get to it. Uh, thank you for this extended introduction. Uh, we will start with Michael as soon as I can stop sharing here. And uh, welcome Michael Halbrais of uh, the uh, 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 Open Technology Institute, New America. And uh, Michael, welcome back. And so, Tell us what you're what you've been doing and what you think we all need to do going forward. Yeah, thanks, Don. You, you really um, got to the to the heart of the e-rate question, which is that you know from our view, uh, a 
school is where the learning takes place. Um, and, you know, and it's not, uh, it's not just, um, you know, inside the building, um, particularly these days, COVID or not. Um, there's no question that quality education today requires broadband internet access at home. And the necessity of remote learning in 2020 has turned the longstanding homework gap into a chasm. Um, only 24% of students returned in person this fall. 80% um, of New York City students are still at home. Chicago, Los Angeles, these are the biggest school districts have not been into a school building yet. And many millions will be out the rest of the school year. The FCC has both the authority and the resources to mitigate the homework gap, and yet it has refused to act. Um, as you said, the Chairman Pai relies on um, kind of one word in, in multiple provisions that could authorize this, the word classrooms, uh, that is, you know, and says, no, no, sorry, um, uh, it, it's limited to in the classroom, you know, at, at, in the school building. I'll come back to what the new FCC can do after January 20th, but first I wanted to highlight a few of the school districts we profile districts that have pioneered a range of innovative approaches to connecting students who lack um, broadband internet at home. These innovative wireless efforts address the current crisis, but they also demonstrate cost-effective and sustainable ways to close the, long, the homework gap long-term. So we have to turn this crisis to our advantage and um, expand E-rate you know, yet again uh, to accomplish that. These school initiated networks fall into several different categories, uh, community Wi-Fi networks, private LTE, that is private uh, cellular networks that leverage um, the new free shared spectrum that Tom Wheeler made available <laughs> in the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. That's the best uh, mid-band spectrum that everybody wants. Uh, it's available for this. Educational broad, uh, educational broadband service uh, spectrum, TB white space is another, targeted locations uh, of Wi-Fi hotspots, mostly school bus Wi-Fi, but in other locations as well. And this final category includes some library efforts, which I won't go into mu too much, I'm, you know, mention one, I know you've been doing that over and over. <clears throat> so first, um, I was you know, really impressed by some school district community Wi-Fi efforts. When schools shut down, a number of districts were ready on day one to shift their most vulnerable students to remote learning. Um, the reason is that places such as Council Bluffs, Iowa, San Jose, uh, the east side of San Jose, California, and rural Lindsay, California, had already built out community Wi-Fi networks in, in their poorest neighborhoods. Uh, for the purpose of closing the homework gap and enabling an inclusive blended learning curriculum based on access to the school's network um, um, at home. Uh, perhaps most emblematic is Lindsay um, Unified School District. It's an agricultural community of 13,000 in California's Central Valley. More than 90% of the school's 4,100 students are free and reduced lunch. Most parents are farm workers who share housing with other families. Half the students enter lacking English proficiency. Um, what the, um, the school determined that um, MiFi hotspots, that is, you know, um, buying subscriptions, even wholesale from mobile carriers, was not financially sustainable. Um, even though they were offered 1,000 um, MiFi hotspots free. Instead, um, they've built out mesh Wi-Fi in the densely populated portions of town and use educational broadcast uh, spectrum uh, in the outlying areas. Um, at first, they put APs on homes of staff and students, um, and then the city uh, got involved and, and you know, gave them access to uh, other other sites like street furniture. Today, 500 APs cover 95% of the district at an average cost of $600 per uh, access point. The one financial drain is the, is the penalty imposed by the FCC 
which requires uh, the district to cost allocate the fiber backhaul, even though they buy far more than they need through the Central Valley's Fiber Backbone Consortium. Lindsay's wireless network is funded primarily through savings on textbooks and print materials. The district's blended learning curriculum has gone all digital and it's having a measurable academic impact. High school, it, uh, it's high school now has the highest graduation and college enrollment rate in the county, despite being one of the poorest. Um, the models vary. Uh, Council Bluffs and San Jose Wi-Fi are premised on partnerships with their city. The city supplies uh, free fiber backhaul, access to street lights and traffic signals, including electric power. Uh, and in return, both of those networks are open to residents um, on a separate SSID, uh, which is and limited to you know five up, five down. Um, it's sort of a, a you know a backup network for the community. Um, funding, just see, because that's always such a critical thing. Um, San Jose's East Side uh, District funded the 2.7 million upfront costs through a voter-approved uh, tech bond. And in Council Bluffs, uh, they've been able to use corporate and foundation grants to build out a new neighborhood each year. So there are about, I think, seven neighborhoods uh, through 10, um, and they'll finish in two or three years. A second category is a, a new option, uh, which leverages the free and shared mobile 5G spectrum available um, uh, at 3.5 gigahertz. And that's the Citizens Broadband Radio Service. And it was a, a, a really a, a visionary accomplishment of Chairman Wheeler. <laughs> Um, which we're hoping to expand uh, now that the uh, FCC is moving back into, uh, in, into better hands in our view. Um, CBRS uh, spectrum, it was a Navy radar band uh, principally um, and that's now uh, shared with the Navy, which continues to use it uh, off the coast. And it's divided between licensed and unlicensed spectrum effectively. We call it general authorized access for schools and anyone else. Uh, because it's mobile 5G spectrum worldwide, the unlicensed portion of the band can support a private LTE network uh, to connect students through a home Wi-Fi hotspot, same as you might buy from a, from a cellular provider. Um, a couple examples, McAllen, Texas provides, uh, before COVID, they started uh, providing, they provide Chromebooks to all 21,000 students but they, could, they found they couldn't assign homework since less than 40% had home broadband. When COVID hit, the district opted to lend out 8,000 mobile carrier MiFi hotspots, but quickly found this was uh, inadequate because of um, sig uh, signal coverage and financially unsustainable once CARES Act relief runs out. The district initially plans to use, um, so instead they're, they're building their own network using CBRS and they, they initially plan to use 24 base stations to connect students at a thousand homes. And by next fall, they hope to connect 6,000, uh, you know, homes with students. Another uh, in a different model is Fontana, California. Fontana is an ex-urban city of 200,000, 50 miles east of LA in San Bernardino County. 85% of the district's 36,000 K-12 students are free and reduced lunch and 55% lack broadband at home. Um, they've entered a partnership with their fiber provider, Crown Castle, which agreed to build out a private LTE network if the district signed on as the long-term anchor tenant. The city will be another tenant and Crown Castle expects to get more. Um, in a few weeks, the initial 50 to 100 households will be connected and the district estimates that it, that it will take uh, 400 CBRS base stations to cover areas where 98% of the students live. CBRS networks are also being initiated with CARES Act funds in Colorado, uh, Utah, and, and Maryland. A third model we described relies on educational broadcast uh, service spectrum at 2.5 gigahertz. Until this year, that spectrum was reserved for colleges and school systems nationwide. Um, those licenses are frozen now and the remaining portions of the band um, um, are expected to be auctioned uh, next year. Uh, but you know, for those uh, areas that have those licenses, as I mentioned, Lindsay, 
um, a local, I think it's a local college, uh, uh, has a license. And they use it. Um, the gear is more expensive, uh, but it's also um, uh, has better quality of service. Um, the best example there is Northern Michigan University operates the most extensive EBS network, connecting their own students and K-12 students across large portions of Michigan's remote uh, and rural Upper Peninsula. Uh, NMU charges individual K-12 families $20 a month for 25-5 service. So that's not 25-3, but they actually got the uplink up to five to make sure um, it works better. And although most low-income students are connected for free, um, um, well, most low-income students are connected for free through wholesale deals with the local school districts. So it's, uh, it's, it's actually more inclusive even than 20 bucks sounds. A fourth category of wireless solution we profile is familiar to all of you, uh, TV white space. Um, those are the vacant TV channels, um, also called super Wi-Fi by Tom's predecessor. Uh, by placing a TV white space transmitter on the roof of a school or a library, um, uh, internet access can be extended out to students within a few miles uh, directly to its network. In fact, two rural districts in Southern Virginia, Charlotte and Halifax County Public Schools, along with Boulder, Colorado's district, filed the first petition years ago seeking a waiver uh, from E-rate restrictions on, um, on doing this. Finally, we described variations of school bus Wi-Fi, as well as other remote um, Wi-Fi hotspots located near students in need. Um, an example, a real good example is um, years before COVID, Kent Washington began placing Wi-Fi kiosks in community centers at public housing projects. Um, there's also libraries um, that are taking advantage, you know, doing this. Uh, uh, one great example is uh, in a small town, Pottsboro, Texas, north of Dallas, which uh, when, after COVID hit, they <clears throat> relocated their Wi-Fi hotspot to the roof of the library and turned up the power so that folks could park, you know, could come into their parking lot or nearby and, and use it. And they've dedicated their um, 25,000 in CARES Act relief to provide Wi-Fi hotspots to local high school students. Which brings us to policy and what the Biden FCC can do potentially on day one. We believe the FCC has the authority uh, to immediately increase E-rate funding and to grant school districts the flexibility to reprogram funds to extend connectivity to students at home. Uh, one uh, particularly, particularly eye-glazing section of this report is um, uh, kind of a summary of, my, of the legal petition I filed back in early April. Um, a similar one was filed by the Schools Health Library Broadband Coalition um, and, you know, basically making this case, you know, why the FCC has this authority. I'd be interested in what Tom has to say, because um, uh, under Obama, the FCC adopted an E-rate pilot, uh, a pilot to connect students at home. And, and even though Commissioner McDowell, who's a Republican, dissented, it wasn't on the basis of authority. Nobody questioned the FCC's authority to add this as a new service at the time. Um, this fall, the... Um, the Trump Interior Department asked the FCC to do this uh, for tribal areas. And more formally, the state of Colorado, um, our friend Phil Weiser, um, who was at the White House under Obama, um, who's the Attorney General, filed a, a formal petition for waiver. The Business Roundtable has just endorsed it this week. Um, so uh, we believe the new FCC chair has the authority to waive current wireline bureau restrictions granting full flexibility to schools. Uh, can you imagine, I mean, the Chicago, Los Angeles, Chicago and other school districts, they won't have been in the building for a year. Um, why would they be using their category two Wi-Fi money uh, internally when they could be connecting students at home, but they're not allowed? Um, plus there's, as I said, the deterrence of cost allocation. Uh, that that uh, Fontana, California, for example, has to rent they have to lease a, an additional fiber connection from Crown Castle for their CBRS network, even though the school runs through the same conduit. 
the schools of uh, the, the scenic, uh, you know, Central Valley. Um, and then secondly, we, we think the uh, commission can immediately increase funding, at least on an uh, emergency basis. There's currently, um, as of July, $500 million in hand, uh, which is carry, unspent carryover money for E-rate that it appears could be spent immediately. And there's $1.3 billion in headroom below the E-rate cap, uh, which is a trickier issue because it means that USAC would need to um, collect that money and the contribution factor is already very high, but for a short period, it, it may well be worth um, uh, increasing um, that. So the call to action is to contact the Biden transition, contact the, de the two de uh, Democratic commissioners at the FCC, Rosenworcel and Starks and members of Congress, urge Congress uh, to, to include a large and flexible funding in the pandemic relief. Um, we don't, it's looking grim right now. Uh, the outline I saw for what they're, for the bipartisan uh, $900 billion proposal has 3 billion uh, for this, um, but you can bet it's not flexible uh, because the ISPs wanna make sure that money goes straight into their pocket. Um, so, so we need to include language that gives local school districts the flexibility in how to use the money and then urge FCC to take action on day one to go back to the understanding of E-rate under Tom Wheeler and uh, provide uh, at least emergency flexibility for schools to reprogram their funds. Michael, That's great it. job covering the landscape there. Uh, it's, it's huge uh, and complex, uh, both technically and politically. Uh, as well as technologically. Uh, you make a great point about uh, uh, the sustainability. And so do you have any sense of the comparative sustainability or rather the ongoing cost structure of, of uh, sustaining one's own network, which is not cost-free, certainly even after the capital investment. And there's a skill set involved here. So uh, yeah, we've seen some school districts able to deploy their own networks I guess in other places where they partnered with, uh, uh, with WISP to do that, like in Pottsboro, there's a commercial WISP that has the, the EBS licenses that, uh, that they're mm -hmm. using. So how, who would be able to do this? What we've run into in, in especially in these rural areas is a lack of, of skills for being able to deploy these, uh, these wide area systems, even relatively simple ones like extending you know, some signal to a few uh, public access points can be a real challenge in small places. So uh, how, how close do the cost of building and maintaining one compared to this? You make a really good point about the unsustainability, I think, of the portable access points. But, you know, do you, have you done any kind of comparisons on that and looked at the skills required to do it? Yeah, yeah. And those are, right, those are two kind of interrelated very good points because I must admit that you know one thing that I found somewhat in common in these very ambitious uh, projects was that there was a champion there, a local a local champion who had some um, chops, you know, had some IT, some right. confidence with IT. Um, you know, it was typically their IT their IT director uh, or, or like in East Side. Uh, San Jose, there's a, a guy there who was a former tech company employee who runs the district's IT and has just been a, a huge champion for this. And they're expanding it out, by the way, um, to, to other parts of the city uh, currently. Um, uh, but, you know, but that's, I think, why you're seeing this movement also toward, for example, that Crown Castle model mm -hmm. with CBRS, where um, I, I think there's a number of companies now that are that could be, you know, interested in um, if the school would sign on as a uh, as an anchor tenant, particularly if you can get the city to sign on as well for an increasing number of their services, rather than assuming that they're going to buy, you know, slices of a mobile carrier network uh, someday in the future after they build out, um, you can aggregate enough demand, in other words, to let somebody else supply this to you as a service, provided you make a commitment. Um, and, um, 
and then like as you said there's partnerships with local wisps i think they're i think yep. they're very eager uh to do that and would probably even move into a new area um it, you know because you know a hard thing is to get access and partnership with a city is critical in san jose for example the city not only provides free access to the light poles and so on and the electricity in those poles um but they also um you know they they mount the uh the access points yeah. uh which brings the cost down and and in return as i said it's a it's a, it, it's not a sub a, a good substitute for home broadband in you know uh, but it um is a backup network because they open it to the uh residents um cost wise i don't have the numbers at my fingertips but once you go out five years it's it, it it's per on a per student basis it's less than half the cost um they crunch the numbers in uh, San Jose and Lindsay in McAllen. And, you know, that's what they they were finding that buying subscriptions, even when they're offered free MiFi hotspots is sort of a, it's like Gillette razor, right? You know, you, they give you the razor and you got to buy blades forever. Right. And it's just too expensive. Yeah. And, I, you know, and that is good quality. Yeah. I think you make an excellent point about the backup network. And uh, we've seen these and we've advocated for this. Uh, as a way to increase resilience, community resilience against what we used to call normal disasters, uh, <laughs> floods, fires, hurricanes, et cetera. Uh, and, and now just every day is a disaster. So any extension of networks that, that uh, has a, a backup capability is really smart and could be a, an important part of a justification for a capital expenditure there. Uh, we've also seen the RENs step up to offer additional uh, capacity uh, outside of the subsidized portion to, to help uh, uh, promote or at least under, underwrite some of the uh, first steps in, in deploying these networks. Uh, they should be really stepping up in, in their uh, uh, adoption of wireless, as we've seen in, in a number of states. You mentioned Michigan and, and Utah and others are, are going beyond their normal you know, uh, wireline to the building uh, approach. And, and you also mentioned the buses, the school buses. I don't think people generally appreciate that there are nearly a half a million school buses. <laughs> That's a lot of hotspots. Of course, it's a big, it's a big hotspot rolling around uh, to get it out there. There should be a smaller version of that that's, uh, that we can distribute these access points. And, and uh, uh, you know, oh, yeah. that, that they, even they, after COVID, by, by four or five, after, by four or five o'clock in the afternoon, they all, they all should be parked somewhere near yeah, st students that you know need connection. And to us, it makes the point. Speaking of backup, there should be a minimal standard of access, just a basic level of, of universal access, public to public information. You know, which we would say the government is obligated to assure access to public information and, and public services. And they don't, they don't know if you, if you confront the government agencies, every agency at every level of government about, well, what about all the people who don't have a connection? You know, Amazon can do that, but you're the government, you can't do that. And they go, oh, well, uh, they can go to the library. Well, yeah, they can, but they don't really share any of that cost savings, you know, from the productivity gains and so forth, from automation with the libraries who have taken on yet another job. Our view is that, that public access stations, we've started to call them, that libraries can deploy, can be that sort of that baseline minimum standard of access within kind of easy reach in every neighborhood, uh, everywhere pretty much, as, a, as a, a backup, as a supplement. You know, it's not just a general outage, it can be a personal outage. We think, we, we describe these as kind of a combination of a uh, of a public phone, an emergency call box, uh, e-government kiosk, and a, a library access point in a, in a physical place fixed more or less mm -hmm. in every neighborhood. Uh, just great stuff. Uh, I think we will turn it over to Tom now. Uh, you set him up pretty well there, Michael, with uh, a number of issues and questions. Uh, so Tom, take us somewhere into the future. Take us somewhere, any place, huh, Tom? <laughs> the future. Uh, 
<laughs> you know, I well, first of all, Don, thanks very much for inviting me to participate and, uh, you know, uh, listening to Michael and reading his paper. Um, I'm reminded of uh, why over the years I've always looked to Michael for his thoughts and leadership uh, on issues. I mean, Michael, it's really an excellent paper. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that I saw in the chat that the uh, link was uh, distributed. Um, and uh, I hope everybody takes a look at it. Um, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but <clears throat> recall, as Mike, Michael was was discussing this, that um, how my eyes were opened um, when I was chairman, um, to the library's role in society, which, you know, I will frankly admit I had missed. Um, and, you know, the E-rate program is the schools and libraries program. And it was always kind of, you know, libraries as the caboose tagging along there behind the schools train. But the more I learned about things, I started joking that we need to rename this the libraries and schools program. <laughs> uh, because uh, of the uh, of the significant role that libraries play and the evolving role that libraries play um, in our uh, society. Um, I'll tell you a quick story. A friend of mine by the name Mike Geekin um is, is uh, with the industrial areas foundation which is a uh, as you might uh, imagine an urban organizing group he spent his whole life organizing uh, uh for uh, social and economic justice uh in in urban centers and um and he recently retired and said you know what kind of organizing can be done in non-urban areas and he decided uh, to take a look at southeastern Ohio, Appalachia, heavy impact of opioids, really suffering. And he went down and he started doing his traditional organizing, which is basically knocking on doors and listening to various community leaders. And typically in industrial areas, it was the churches that provided the leadership. And Mike tells me that what he found in Southeast Ohio, it was the libraries that were stepping up. It was the librarians that were a focal point for their community. And, it, and, and their outreach insofar as internet access was proving to be you know, one of the essential services that they provide at at this point um, in time. Um, you know, I, um, I was on the phone with Mike the other day and this is not a, a obviously a rural uh, Ohio uh, story, but I was on the phone with the president of the Brooklyn Public Library who was telling me about what happens after they close their doors when people sit on the steps in inclement weather even to get the Wi-Fi that leaks through the doors so that they can have connectivity. I remember when I was chairman, I was out on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation um, in, uh, in South Dakota. And um, this little, you know, I don't mean this pejoratively, but this little one horse library, this little small building in the middle of the Pine Ridge Foundation, uh, you go past there uh, at, at night um, and there's all kinds of cars parked there as people are getting on the most important network of the 21st century because the only way they can do it is is through a library. And um, and so, you know, I think that you guys are all doing the Lord's work in terms of how does that essential local institution of the library step up in this time of need um, and particularly uh, how does it step up to connect everybody. I could not agree more with Michael um, about 
how the FCC has blown it on um, using their programs. You know, I, Chairman Pai loves to proclaim my number one priority is closing the digital divide. But he hasn't. And he hasn't shown the creativity and the flexibility and the innovative spirit. And frankly, I think the desire to do more than get the political points of being able to proclaim that your number one priority is closing the digital divide. You know, and, and, and there are two realities that go with that job. Number one is that it is the tendency of government to continue doing today the same thing that was done yesterday. That's safe. But the problem is that that attitude has been ambushed by what we're finding now in a national crisis. And we have seen the FCC develop a new program for rural health, but we haven't seen the FCC develop new programs for libraries. The second point that I would make is that the chairman of the FCC is one of the great jobs in Washington. Um, it, is a, it is a job of amazing power. Yes, you have uh, four other commissioners, um, but the reality is that everybody in the agency works for you. Um, that you never, the other commissioners never get to vote on something unless you decide they're gonna vote on it and you approve the language they're going to vote on. And, and this is the important point that is applicable right now. And there is incredible authority that exists on delegated authority as a result of previous commission actions. And a leader can take that authority and use it. I mean, optimally bring it to a vote at the commission um, the, to respond to Michael's uh, petition or, uh, or, or, or Attorney General Weiser's uh, petition that E-rate ought to be able to be used um, for expansive purposes in a crisis moment. But instead, this chairman sat on that power, that opportunity um, uh, to make a difference. Um, I share um, Don and Michael's hope that um, the Biden FCC will early on step up and exercise that power. And frankly, I saw in the in the chat, while Michael was talking, somebody was asking the question, what happens with the 2-2 tie at the FCC to affect that? And, um, and, and I think the answer to that is, it is very important who the next chairman of the commission is and uh, whether he or she is willing to step up and authorize some of these expansive determinations about the commission's authority. And yes, somebody may take you to court. I mean, you know, I mean, as Michael can tell you, there is not a major decision made at the FCC that does not go to court, period, end of discussion. Somebody may take you to court on this. And in a couple of years, the court may say you're wrong. But in that intervening period, people have been connected. Students have been able to do their work. And hopefully, 
the crisis has passed. We need that kind of an attitude at the commission that will take advantage of, as I said, the rather significant powers that exist in the hands of the chairman of the FCC. Um, and, um, and let's hope that we have a chairman that, or chair that is willing to, uh, to not only recognize the kinds of needs that you all have been talking about here, but also instead of sitting around and saying, well, how do we traditionally deal with this? Say, how are we gonna change how we deal with this? So Don, I'll be happy to go any place else you wanna go in, the, in, in discussion. Indeed, Tom, and, and thank you very much. Your, your uh, expression of support for, for libraries is most welcome. Uh, as I say, uh, we make the case they're the most uh, <laughs> underappreciated uh, institution by people who are really important <laughs> constituents. Even though roughly half the population are active library card holders, library members, roughly half, and roughly Pre-pandemic, one in three adults access the internet at a library. 80 million people rely on public libraries, either entirely or partially, for internet access. And, and Judith made the point about meaningful access, meaningful uh, in the sense that just providing raw access is one thing, but for a lot of people, they need support, they need help. And where do they get that? more than any other place, it's the public library. And yet uh, we find there are kind of three principal groups that fail to appreciate libraries. Wealthier people, they go, well, I'll just one click at Amazon. What's, you know, uh, technologists tend to uh, underappreciate libraries. Uh, they go, they still exist, they're still around, really? Uh, and then also we find politicians, amazingly, don't, really get libraries. I, I, they seem to be, I don't want to say less literate, but they seem to have less appreciation for the cultural value to society and the, uh, and the base level uh, uh, services value that libraries provide. And all three of those uh, constituencies be very valuable for communities to have, but the general public they love libraries. You, you start to try to close a library and, you know, they come out in force. And, and, and librarians themselves have been, I would say, less than stellar advocates for their own uh, institutions. They're more reticent. Uh, they are civil servants uh, and they tend to not want to jump into political uh, discussions. Except well, as I said, as I said, Don, it was a learning experience for me when I was chairman. You know, I mean, my library experience had had been when I was growing up and would have to pay two cents a day for overdue books, right? Yeah. The world has changed a bit <laughs> since then, I discovered. <laughs> you and me, Tom. <laughs> they pretty much dispense with late fees now. That's another change that's happened. There uh, is uh, nearly all the libraries seem to have, you know, just bring it back, you know, uh, and right now, uh, that that whole cycle of returning physical materials has been interrupted by the virus because yeah, right. not knowing you know what's safe to do and how to do it, new systems have to be developed. Uh, what what do you you, you made the statement that uh, you know that that fixing you you remind me your statement of, of of patching the old program and throwing it out is a lot like software and you know patching it here and there or the. The you know uh, the, the the Microsoft operating system is just you know just patch after patch after patch, and it gets unwieldy and and I it kind of reminds me of the regulatory system. So, what does it mean to really throw it out? This this yeah. Well, and the this, problem is who do you? Who, the challenge becomes that every program has its own constituency. So here's so an example that 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 we did during my tenure, as you know, was reform the E-rate program. Um, and, um, and I was stunned 
at the amount of opposition that we had. Um, for instance, the National Education Association representing the teachers opposed what we were doing to bring broadband to the schools because they were afraid that we were at that point in time, about a billion dollars, a billion dollars was being spent every year on dial up telephone lines because it was a it was a legacy from when access to the internet was dial up. Mm -hmm. And 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 that money was being spent on dial up telephone lines, on pagers. Who uses a pager anymore? Um on 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 paying for email services my god it, it, all of us on this now use free email services but the concern was that if that money disappears then there won't be enough money to pay teachers there's a billion dollars taking out taken out of the budget and so so um so we ended up totally overhauling the program. We ended up going from $2 billion a year to $4 billion a year for libraries and schools. We ended up requiring that it has to be broadband uh, and you can't use it for dial up and pagers um, and, and, and things like this. And like I said, I was amazed at the opposition that was ginned up. Another interesting thing was the um, the, the original E-rate program specified that it was only the local telephone company that could provide the connectivity. I remember meeting with a. I, I will I will leave out the specifics, but um, I I was um, at a school. And they were telling me what they paid for uh, basic internet service. And I was rolling my eyes. And it happened that the next day, I was having breakfast with the CEO of the company providing that service. And I said to him, how in the world can you charge that school that much money? And his answer was, and this is a quote, because I can. And the light, you know, Mrs. Wheeler's son may not be the brightest bulb in the socket, but the light did go off. And so what we said was that, um, that uh, anybody qualified was available to receive the funds, including the school itself being able to build or the library itself building the connectivity. And, and the telephone companies fought it tooth and nail. There were commissioners that fought it tooth and nail. But you know what happened, Don? <laughs> As a, this, this amazing, fabulous American concept called competition paid off. And suddenly connections increased because, oh my God, I don't want somebody else running this line through here. And prices decreased. We went from when I took office, the average price was about twenty gigab twenty dollars a gigabit. When I left, it was two dollars a gigabit. All as a result of competition and us saying, no, we're not just going to provide some kind of subsidy program for the local monopoly. We're going to say the goal, the goal is to connect schools and to connect libraries, and we'll support anybody that can do that. And by golly, competition worked. But, May, but overhauling those program, the, overhauling the programs to do that, you know, it, it, you 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 had to bring around everybody from the teachers to the telephone companies. It, it, it's uh, extraordinary, Tom, and, and it's a perfect example of an overhaul, a dramatic overhaul of a program. You mentioned uh, all the successes, most of the successes in that overhaul uh, to, to broaden competition of providers beyond just commercial interests. Very, very different approach to doing business, a, a nonprofit, especially if it's a community-based organization. 
and, and dark fiber. You also uh, allow dark fiber to use a huge asset laying fallow. Uh, you're right about these legacy systems. Uh, people were out there paying $1,000, $1,500 a month for a T1 line. Well, how long ago did that, did the, that capital cost get recovered? But yeah, they just, I just, because we can, because they paid it yesterday, they'll just pay it today. And, and, and that amount of money, you can build fiber. Just, and we're seeing it done. We've seen it done, uh, thanks to what you were able to do. It's just phenomenal uh, uh, work uh, that has gone. I don't know what the, the connectivity levels, you know, the gigabit level connectivities were to say schools uh, before those changes, but we're up to 90 plus percent now, I believe school districts have. So I can give you the answer to that. When I came into office, um, there were um, about a third of the schools, and I'm sorry, I only have the school statistic. This, about a third of the schools in the country had fiber connections. And of those, about half had Wi-Fi that took that connection to the student's desk. When we left, over 95% of the schools in America had high-speed Wi-Fi connections to every student's desk. Yeah, great. I'm glad you had that. And you do mention an additional part uh, to the E-rate program, uh, the, the Category 2, uh, which was new. Uh, right. In addition to the plus two, uh, two billion to the to the regular program, we had additional two billion and now ongoing for in-house connectivity, which is essential. It's it's Michael's point. Effectively, if you're not connecting people, you're not connecting anything of any value. <laughs> you know, you can connect all the buildings and all the classrooms and chairs you want to. But if there's not a person at the end of that link, it doesn't really help. And that's what Wi-Fi really helped do. Uh, but you set up a, a, a question. Uh, uh, the schools have really done well at this. Uh, the library's not nearly so well. Uh, it's about an eight to one ratio of facilities, of school built K-12 school buildings to the library uh, facilities, but the libraries receive much less than one eighth of the E-rate funds. A large part of that is because uh, a lot of libraries are, are small independent entities that, that don't have the kind of uh, administrative uh, uh, resources to, to deal with the applications. Uh, another is that they require filtering, which librarians tend to resist uh, as any uh, form of censorship. Uh, right. uh, and, and also that, uh, uh, that, it, that, it's, that it's just more difficult for them to do. So what do you think is the answer to bring that into balance? To uh, you, you reference, you touched on, uh, some something special for libraries. What do you imagine that would look like? So, um, so it seems to me that um, if you take the concept that Michael was developing, that the classroom is not necessarily in a brick building, but it is anywhere. And then you take the concept that we put into the reform of the E-rate program that said it's not who does it but that it gets done and their opportunity for libraries is to become the, the, the new flexible vehicle for getting that kind of delivery done. You know, I mean, it's outrageous that, um, that uh, there are like 12 million students today in Cape 12 who don't have the internet in their home. You know, this, another thing that this administration did was, you know, gut efforts to, uh, to, 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 to facilitate um, uh, connectivity uh, of low-income Americans. Um, libraries can do that. You know, we've seen um, throughout the country, you know, innovative programs, hotspots, mesh networks, et cetera. Um, and, um, and, and so the opportunity, the, the name of the game is to deliver 
the results and the results are more important than who delivers it. And the problem is that goes against the way things have always been done and it goes against existing econo economic power bases, but it needs to be the kind of message that gets delivered. How do you deliver results, not who delivers the results? Beautiful, Tom. Uh, that would be a perfect last word, uh, but I think we're gonna give, uh, give Michael a chance to uh, uh, say something as we close out here. And then we'll come back, Tom. We'll have you- I, I, no, I apologize. I am gonna have to, to okay. run here in a second. I'm gonna stick around to hear what Michael says because I always want to hear what Michael says, but then I'm gonna have to run. Thank you so much, Tom. You're, you're a champion. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I don't really have too much to add. I, I think that was a, a perfect uh, combination. I'm, I'm very pleased that, that Tom could, you know, that Tom agrees that this is, we really are missing a huge opportunity here that the, um, the chairman has the authority and the ability uh, to move to move forward on this and and this uh, this concept that you both talked about, you know that um, that learning is where the student and teacher are, you know that that education can take place in in many places, many ways, and particularly now with technology, that we really need to be thinking, um, as I said at the outset, take advantage of this emergency to prove this out. Um, and then we, we should, there should be another E-rate uh, reform, you know, so Chairman Wheeler brought category two and extending, not just bringing the pipe to the school, but getting that connectivity to the, to the chair of every student and teacher. And now we have to extend that again. And I don't know if it's category three funding or if it will simply be an expansion, more flexibility in, 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 and more funding for title for category two. Uh, but whatever it is, um, that's the next thing because blended, you know, variations on blended learning, incorporating technology, closing the homework gap entirely, um, those are going to be really important for education. And hopefully the, the Secretary of Education would, you know, join hands in this effort as well. Well, thank you, Michael. I, I think you've created a, 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 an exciting setup, both of you actually, for. Uh, the new year and the new administration. And uh, we're gonna be there uh, pushing for these ideas and we know you're gonna be there and we'll be right behind you. So thank you both for just a fascinating discussion. Uh, this will be up on Monday and uh, Tom, you're still here. You have something else for us. No, oh, I just was gonna say thank you for inviting me. Happy holidays uh, to, uh, to everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Happy course. holidays to you too. And with that, we will uh, close the recording. Thank you all.